Jim Knight, Schools Minister, welcome. Now, looking at your CV, it's not a very typical one for a politician. You're involved in managing arts venues, involved in a travelling theatre company and running a publishing company, and then a very rapid rise uh, into ministerial ranks. And you've been schools minister since May 2006, so two and a half years. That's a pretty long record compared to many others. Um, you hoping, expecting to stay a bit longer? <laughs> I'm hugely enjoying uh, being schools minister. I'm very happy to have uh, remained uh, in post whilst you know, everything else changes around me. And I have to ask, running a, a theatre company, how useful was that as preparation for being in charge of schools? Well, the, the funny thing about doing theatre is that uh, it's always got to be all right on the night, so however much chaos there is backstage out front, it's all got to look perfectly planned and perfectly orderly. And uh, so yeah, people who've worked in theatre are generally pretty good at crisis management, which occasionally comes in handy. Now you've just had a bit of a change of responsibilities when Lord Adonis uh, left the department, so you've taken on City Academy. So let's perhaps just begin on mm. that. Um, where do you think we are with City Academy? Is there still a sense that it's very mixed fortunes for Academy? Some are doing very well, others not so well. Um, where do you see the programme moving? Well, the vast majority are doing really well, and, and when we look at the evaluations and the analysis that we're having uh, come into the department done independently, for us, then we see them improving at twice the national average, for example, in terms of GCSE results. Um, so I'm very happy with you know, what actually happens on the ground. I've made no secret of the fact that uh, until I visited an academy, I was sceptical. Um, because people I'd, were concerned that you weren't quite such an enthusiast as Lord Adair you know, was. Well, you know, I'd read, uh, this was, you know, three years ago, I'd been reading all of the, the stuff in the media and you know, all the talk about them, you know, whether they were cheating uh, in, in various ways. Um, as then I, I, the first one I visited, I think, was the City of Bristol uh, Academy. Um, and I was bowled over by what a, a different sort of uh, environment it was to everything I was expecting and, and how open and accessible it was, it was you know, local admissions uh, and really transforming things for that community in the south of Bristol. I've since, um, over the last two and a half years, been able to visit a whole series of academies and I've always been massively impressed by what I've seen and I'm therefore an extremely strong and passionate advocate for them. You know, on the basis that they've got fair admissions, that they're taking in more than their fair share of free school meals pupils, that they're taking in more than their fair share of children with special educational needs, that they are really dealing with some of our most difficult um, educational challenges and doing a, a really good job. Is there still a lot to be done in secondary schools? I mean, after we've just had the Ofsted annual report, which uh, found that 9% of secondary schools were still uh, inadequate, unsatisfactory, and, and that's quite a tough judgment. You know, even satisfactory isn't always mm -hmm. that wonderful in Ofsted mm -hmm. terms. Um, is there a lot to do, and is the answer to that 9%, that is that always becoming a city academy? It's not always becoming a city academy. We've got the National Challenge Trust as an option now. I mean, it, I, I think the 9% the inadequate figure that came through from the annual report is a, a justification and a vindication of us having to pr proceed with the National Challenge um, so that we have got strategies to deal with those that, that are stuck. And does it mean um, they're all failing? No, no. Because no. I, I, that was, a, as you know, there was a lot of outcry amongst head teachers. They felt, you know, some of them in very difficult circumstances yeah. were doing a good job, but they felt they were all lumped together in this list of named and shamed schools. Yeah. I know it wasn't quite like that, but that's no. how it I mean, came we, we, we deliberately launched the national challenge at a school that was below 30%, but was improving very rapidly, the Knights Academy in South London. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, by no means could anyone regard that as a failing school. So, yeah, at the time we tried to do what we could to position this so that it wasn't that you know all, uh, the schools below thirty percent. So, I mean, were how, as how would you characterise them? Are there national challenge schools are schools that somehow have got to do better or need greater help or got to raise their game. I mean, if not necessarily failing, what, how would you characterise them? Well, within what was six hundred and thirty-eight, now probably somewhere around four hundred and seventy-five. We'll, we'll get the final figure when the GCSE results are. Uh, finally confirmed. Um, but within that, you've got some who are stuck. You've got some who are rapidly improving. They need very little help in order to get above um, 30%. You've got some that are somewhere between the two and they need a, a little bit of support, uh, perhaps targeted support in English and maths, perhaps some more uh, funding for one-to-one -one tuition. Now, a lot of people are concerned that, that identifying those national challenge schools was a way of actually getting some more schools lined up to become academies and you have this target of 400 at the moment. Is there a sense that in, from government that actually you, that is your favoured solution, that there would be a city academy where a school is not responding? 
Well, you know, the academy isn't going to be the answer in every single circumstance. Um, and, you know, some local authorities uh, come to us with other ways that um, we can see could work in order to lift uh, standards in schools that are stuck, um, that aren't academies. So, you know, we're not uh, ideological about this. Um, it's what works. One of the things that, you know, has become very apparent to me over the last two and a half years is that in England we have some fantastic expertise in education in our schools and we've not been tapping into that systematically. We've now got several uh, tranches of uh, national leaders in education who are doing just that, bringing their expertise into schools that need their support. So there are all sorts of ways that you can do it. Academies we know work, but there are other things that can work too. Let's look a little bit about uh, at testing and assessment. Now we had the big announcement a while ago about the, the ending of the, uh, the national curriculum tests at age 14. Uh, and of course that followed all the problems with the marking of, of the yeah. tests, uh, particularly the, the uh, test at age 11. Was it just that you, the marking system couldn't cope and one lot had to go and you wanted to keep the ones at the end of primary school? What was the reasoning behind it? No, I, I, I mean if, if we felt it was just uh, that we couldn't get all the scripts marked accurately then uh, we Which was found, a problem. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a problem but it's been done before mm. that we've been able to do it all and um, uh, you know, I, I believe that it's possible um, for a contractor or contractors to do it. You could have split the contract and then you'd have had, uh, you know, you could have had extra capacity in order to be able to do it if that was the right thing to do for education and in the end the decision has to be governed by what's the right educational a decision to be made and so it was made on the basis that you know, we, we'd had the key stage three sats for some time they were performing a function in driving forward uh, progression in learning through the early years of secondary um, but they weren't really being used to uh, for parents to judge the performance of secondary schools uh, in many ways for us to judge the performance of secondary schools the national challenge was an indication that we we're focusing on GCSE in respect of that um, and so the benefits of the key stage three sets were becoming outweighed by the disbenefits we've asked the expert group to look at how we can drive forward progression in learning in the early years um, in, 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 instead of the key stage three sets um, and I think in the end, uh, alongside a national sample so that we can, you know, at a national level know how we're doing midway three s through secondary, I think, I think that's the right call. Doesn't mean that we should get rid of key stage two sets though. Okay, but in a word, key stage two sets, are they going to be marked okay this year? I am confident that, you know, and, and you yeah, know, obviously a consequence of getting rid of key stage three sets is that it's an easier job to just do the one set. So, you know, I've got confidence about those arrangements. Let's look at the review that's going on of primary education. Now, some people have said that the remit that you gave to Sir Jim Rose, which precluded any looking at, at tests and assessment, actually really limited that review. What would you say about that? I, I think it was really important that um, after quite some time, that we looked at the primary curriculum in the same way that we've, we've been able to look at secondary recently and been able to free up quite a lot of time, trust teachers' professional judgment a lot more in secondary. We needed to be able to look at how we did that in primary alongside what, you know, from Deering's review on language, mm. you know, we've said that we want um, seven-year-olds and onwards to be able to study a language. Um, for me, looking at the ICT curriculum, I think that we need to get more of the ICT learning that takes place in secondary into primary um, so that children are ready when they start secondary. It, it so, was so described as a root and branch yeah. review, wasn't it? And yet, can you have a root and branch review if you take away ass assessment? Because we all know assessment goes entirely with the curriculum. You know, you, you, what you teach is going to be governed by how you're going to test. Yeah, but I think it's right to start with the curriculum. Uh, and work out what it is that we want to ensure that every pupil has as an entitlement when they go to primary school, uh, what it is that gives the continuity um, through the key stages and then on to, into secondary. Then we can think about assessment. Now the other big change obviously in curriculum and assessment is the new diplomas. They've mm. got off to a fairly slow start really this year in terms of, of numbers. Uh, what sort of numbers do you think you need to make sure that they really are embedded and therefore they would survive were there to be a change of government? Well, I suppose I'd summarise by saying sizes and everything. It's the, it's the quality uh, that we want to make sure that we've got right from, right from the word go. And as I've visited uh, 
diploma learning and, and talk to learners and, and teachers. I've been really pleased with the experience that people are having so far in, in Cheshire and most recently in the Kingswood area of Bristol, um, where huge enthusiasm for people getting up every morning and coming into school and college and enjoying the learning they're doing, teachers uh, enjoying the style of teaching that they've uh, been able to develop and looking forward to transferring that into some of their other teaching as well. Um, that's very exciting. Um, and I don't really want to get that hung up on numbers um, because I just want the, the quality to be right because then and now we're finding Oxford and Cambridge for example saying that they want to take on engineering diploma graduates, they've been designed by employers, they want to take people on with these and they're getting very well engaged in the learning that's taking place. So if it starts a little slowly then I, that gives me confidence it will build up into something uh, really powerful by the time the entitlement comes in in 2013. Isn't one of the problems with the diplomas though that um, you're very concerned about them having an academic respectability, you mentioned uh, Oxford and Cambridge, but one result of that is some people say there's not really much real practical, vocational, hands-on mm. learning, which is actually what you need to, to appeal particularly to those young people who you're going to be requiring to stay on in education and who aren't. Um, has that area been neglected of the diplomas? I don't think so. I mean, throughout my two and a half years being responsible for the diplomas, I've uh, avoided describing them as vocational diplomas, and I think it's a mistake for those people that want to position them as vocational as opposed to academic. I see them as a bridging qualification. They're a bridge both to university, the world of work, but also into vocational learning. Uh, and it's important in terms of the additional specialist learning, which is an aspect of the diploma uh, design and structure, um, that for those people, for example, who want to do a level two diploma because they know which sector they think they're interested in, they then decide, oh, actually, I know, now know as a result of doing my level two what occupation I want, so they don't want to do a level three apprenticeship, but they can do some additional specialist learning in order to give them the practical skill that will allow them to be able to go on with confidence into that uh, level three apprenticeship. Um, so we're developing the additional specialist learning all the time. Uh, but it's really important that people don't think, oh, I'm not sure about these diplomas because they're not practical enough. Um, they should be academic and practical um, because they are a way into university or they're also a way into work. Now, finally, we're beginning to hear talk about the next election, rightly or wrongly, uh, but either way, it can't be that far away. What would you hope, whether or not you're a schools minister then, what would you hope that uh, a Labour government would do if it gets a fourth term in terms of schools? What would be your two or three big things you'd like to see happen? Well, I want to see us continuing with the school building programme, with more services being uh, located together. We're seeing the start of more all through schools, but children's centres, but also locating some other services on, on school sites. So they're more of a gateway for whole communities into learning into some other public services. And uh, for teachers, continuing the investment in them, in their continuous professional development, in their skill, because in the end, without good leadership and good teaching, we really can't progress in education and I think over the last 10 years um, we've shown a really good record in investing in all of those things. And would you like to be around still as schools minister if you do get that fourth term? I'd love to carry on having responsibility for what I have at the moment. It's a fantastic job. Okay, Jim Knight, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.